Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us, our webinar today. I'm Thomas Tig. I'm the president and CEO of Direct Relief, and it's really a privilege and a pleasure for me to host such a, a great panel that we have today. As you may have seen, I think, is uh, the rolling slides for a setup. I think we have um, what health centers are. We have three medical directors from health centers in Los Angeles County to join us today. And I think you saw the the breadth and the demographics of who health centers serve. Those were statistics from uh, the National Association of Community Health Centers. So I think it gives you a sense of this vast network that exists to serve people who are medically underserved, who tend to be disproportionately low income, uh, living in, at or near poverty, and disproportionately members of ethnic and racial minority groups. As the coronavirus pandemic has unfolded, it's very close to who's gotten slammed the hardest in the United States, the demographic profile and the places that have experienced the, the pandemic most severely with um, more infections, less testing, uh, more hospitalizations and higher rates of fatalities are reflective of the demographic profile of the patients that are served by community health centers. So for today, I think uh, it's a pleasure, you know, and some insight that can be offered. You know, surprisingly, the United States has been the, the global hotspot of this pandemic. And within the United States, uh, it's been California that until very recently, it shifts a bit, has been the hotspot within the nation. Within California, it has been Los Angeles County that has been the hotspot with <laughs> area within the hotspot state. And within Los Angeles County, it's the three uh, health centers of which our three panels today represent in different places, uh, their community. So uh, I just wanna thank you all for, for joining us today. I think for Direct Relief, it's important as we receive financial support and other support to let people who gave us that support know what we did with it and why. Uh, you know, we have provided over $50 million in financial support, which is a bit unusual for direct relief, but we're notoriously cheap and we try to provide the services that we typically do as, as efficiently as we can. And when financial resources are available, we can complement the material support that we typically provide to uh, the groups we're already supporting. Usually that begins with health centers, free and charitable clinics, and people who work in areas of chronic poverty and chronic need. And unsurprisingly, it is those places and people who have chronic challenges with respect to accessing health services who get slammed the hardest in any emergency, whether it's a flood, earthquake, fire, or hurricane. And so COVID is different in type, but not different in effect. And for us at Direct Relief, it's a natural plug-in point to ask those who live in and work in and serve people who face chronic challenges uh, what to do, what they need, how we can support them with a high degree of trust that they'll figure it out because they tend to do that every time. So with that opening, thank you all for joining us. It's my pleasure to turn it on, uh, over uh, to our first speaker, Dr. Derek Butler, um, to talk about himself and his clinic and uh, health center and his experience going forward. Dr. Butler. Thank you, Thomas. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Derek Butler. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at the Two Help Everyone Health and Wellness Centers, um, known as the THE Clinic um, here in South Los Angeles. We are a federally qualified community health center um, in existence for over 40 years, uh, primarily serving the, the <clears throat> underserved populations here in South Los Angeles. Um, we have five sites uh, where we provide primary care, primarily to adults, children. Um, we have women's health services and also services for people living with HIV and AIDS um, and behavioral health services also for our clients who, again, are 99% um, would could be considered under underserved or in the lower um, strata of, of, of the socioeconomic um, demographic and primarily patients of color, both Latino and African-American. And we have currently been um, riding this wave of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic here uh, with numerous challenges, numerous opportunities. 
Uh, we've been uh, fortunate to have partnership with uh, organizations like Direct Relief. We've been extremely helpful in our efforts. Um, and um, we have been able to maintain our services with our populations, but again, have challenges that I hope we can bring to light and share with all of you today. So um, I look forward to questions, um, thoughts, and any um, um, inquiries as to what we're doing and how we're doing as I share with my colleagues. Um, I'll give it back to Thomas and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, thank you for the introduction. I think we can give you a sense of your communities, um, what you're doing, the patients you serve, and then talk a bit about how the pandemic has unfolded as we go forward. But okay. Um, I'd be happy to elaborate on that. Okay. Okay. Um, well, um, and I'll, honestly, with um, I think none of us could believe that we'd still be managing or dealing with this pandemic almost a year later. And when this hit, it did take us um, by surprise. We had to do some very, very rapid changes in our operations to manage that onslaught, and especially when the first lockdowns came in March. I mean, one of the major challenges was transitioning to doing remote visits with our clients. And that was something we had not yet started. We had to do that really within a month or two, actually having to do um, switch to our, uh, to avoid um, the uh, patients who are coming in who may be infected. We had to implement multiple, multiple uh, uh, measures to prevent transmission within our clinics. And then also in terms of the challenge of making our appointments, which used to be all in person, actually transitioning into some remote way. And we did not have a telemedicine um, uh, capability set up. We had to do that very quickly um, by doing visits by telephone. We went from probably 100% in-person visits to more than 70 to 80% um, by telehealth. One of our challenges is with our populations, again, because of their socioeconomic status, many folks don't have internet at home. Many folks don't have a very good cell phone in order to do some of the televisits and use those, those apps and those other features that many folks have who have more resources. We also had to actually manage the issue of our staff. And most of our staff also come from this community. And many times with infection rates being high in, in, in their communities, we could make our clinic as safe as possible with our measures, but many times patients would, our staff would go home and then be exposed to what was going on in the community. So we did have issues with some staff who actually were becoming infected, having to test those folks and actually losing staff who had to be quarantined, et cetera, as we went forward with that too. I mean, we really saw the fragility of these social determinants affect our ability to deliver care when the pandemic hit, as I talked about, just rolling out telemedicine, managing uh, our staff who were also patients, issues with transportation, et cetera, for patients, for instance, who needed to come to the clinic, maybe if they had symptoms to get tested and then find a way to get them managed at the same time. And then also the mistrust of, of the system, the information that was being broadcast at the time, as you know, from the top down was very confusing for many folks. Um, people were afraid and really had no solid information. And many times, at least if we were able to contact them, we could give them really solid information around um, where and how they could get tested, uh, especially in those early days, and what to do if they were infected, if they had a contact, et cetera, and try to manage all those things kind of um, really working at once. I think uh, one of my a fellow uh, medical director CEO said that we, this whole year, most of us in the health centers have been building this shit while it's in the middle of the ocean just trying to put together these policies, these protocols, these measures to keep our clinics safe, to manage our patients, to help them learn and, and to be safe throughout the pandemic. And um, you know, it's been, it's been quite a year and quite a ride. And unfortunately, I don't, again, I don't think any of us expect it to still be really now almost, I almost feel like we're starting over almost a year later, right now on the crux of now having a vaccine because again, this is another huge effort we're gonna to need to actually um, implement here in our health centers. Again, overcoming these same social determinants of health that affect the ability to deliver regular care, but now how we're gonna roll out a vaccine to our populations to get them educated on the vaccine, to deal with mistrust about the system, to manage getting people to clinic to get vaccine, manage the issues around side effects, et cetera. And um, again, affect change with this, uh, you know, with, with the new features that are coming out right now. Um, 
it's it's really exciting in some ways. I think working in health centers is, I call it, it's it's challenging and never boring. And I think now, you know, we've really been tested. I think all of us have have really doubled down on our commitment and passion to serving this population now in light of, of, of COVID and having resources out there that um, have been available has been a huge help to us doing this. And we hope that, you know, we still continue to have the support as we do this work. So I think, um, I hope that elaborate a little more. I, um, I hope that during our discussion, we can pinpoint some of those, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butler. I think there's a, a lot of things I, I'm sure people are curious about some of the things you mentioned, including the really the relative ability of your patients to, you know, work remotely, stay at home, you know, you know park there and call Uber Eats. You know, it, it's not an option for a lot of people, no, as well as some not. of the references you made to kind of the euphemism of, you know, vaccine hesitancy, which I, is different for different people. And, and I think uh, I'm sure Dr. Bolin and Dr. Shapiro will have some comments, but but thank you. If we can turn it over to Dr. Robert Bolin um, for his take on his facility, what he's seeing, how it's unfolding for him and his community and his patients. Dr. Bolin? Hi there. Thanks for uh, inviting uh, us to be part of this and uh, thanks for putting this together. This is really a tremendous opportunity to uh, share with those who don't really fully understand, uh, you know, what uh, community health centers are all about. Um, the Los Angeles LGBT Center uh, has been in existence since uh, about the mid-1960s. Uh, we started as a sexually transmitted uh, disease uh, clinic uh, back in the 60s uh, and came into being because uh, our patient population was really not being adequately uh, served by the public health uh, department's uh, STD services. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, kind of our uh, DNA roots, as you were, uh, if you will. Uh, and we rapidly became a very uh, significant uh, provider of services in those uh, first uh, uh, first uh, couple of decades. But then when uh, HIV uh, came along, uh, we rapidly had to pivot uh, to uh, dealing with then new epidemic that was uh, disproportionately affecting, uh, you know, the LGBT community. Uh, and we learned a lot of things about community organizing and, and uh, 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 communicating within our own community um, uh, with that epidemic that is now serving us uh, well into this current pandemic. Uh, we pivoted to uh, general primary care in about 1997 uh, or 98, uh, and now serve a, a full range of primary care services uh, for an LGBT uh, population. Um, uh, we, we have a very significant uh, transgender uh, community uh, uh, that we serve, uh, and we have a very large, uh, continue to have a very large STD program. Um, so I just wanted to point out that, that all healthcare centers, uh, wherever we are, we are all formed in the same way. We were all formed by members of our own community uh, who were visionary and determined uh, to develop healthcare services that was tailored to a specific community. So we all share that same DNA. The way to think about uh, uh, LGBT health is that it is layered on top of all of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Butler was uh, talking about for his his community. So we also are we are a federally qualified healthcare center. We are also serving uh, a previously underserved uh, population uh, that are economically uh, and uh, socially disadvantaged in many ways. In addition to the uh, LGBT stigma that has existed for so long in this country. Uh, so it's an additional layer of complexity when it comes to uh, providing healthcare services. Um, I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that uh, the best providers of healthcare are the ones who have the cultural competence to meet their patients where they are and to learn and understand all of the various social determinants of healthcare that uh, shape their particular 
fears and health beliefs and hesitancies for uh, uh, seeking health care, worries about being castigated or shamed uh, or uh, uh, ignored. Um, all of those things are uh, part and parcel of how community health organizations reach out to their populations. So um, I think that in terms of our responses to the uh, HIV, I mean, the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, exactly the same as what Dr. Butler was uh, cat uh, uh, cataloging. Uh, we very rapidly pivoted to uh, telehealth services, um, never having done that before. Um, our patients have exactly the same kind of challenges. Some of them are very well healed and, you know, uh, uh, have complete um, uh, fluency with uh, social media and uh, uh, all of the other uh, means of communicating, uh, and many are not. Uh, I just saw a patient this morning who, uh, Spanish-speaking only, he doesn't know how to use a computer, he doesn't know how to use a cell phone, uh, and he's having trouble even interacting with our agency because as we've gotten uh, uh, more and more into the uh, uh, remote services with telehealth, uh, we're struggling with some of that personal connection that we need to have, you know, to keep people engaged and to reach out to every single person who, who uh, may be struggling. Um, so I think that those of us who are in community health care centers are really the best able to communicate with our, our patients who may be suspicious or reluctant uh, to uh, believe that they uh, should think about getting a, a COVID vaccine. Uh, they're suspicious about the research that's been going on that, uh, uh, that has brought us the vaccines that we have right now. They're concerned that uh, perhaps these uh, subjects that were part of these studies did not equally reflect uh, you know their own uh, their own situation, and we are the best able to communicate with with those folks and to educate them and convince them that these vaccines are safe and effective and must be administered quickly and must be administered now. So those of us who are in healthcare centers should not really be at the bottom of the totem pole uh, when it comes to uh, you know receiving uh, vaccines to to d disseminate throughout the community. We should be the first uh, uh, in line to, uh, uh, you know, to help with this vaccine, um, uh, these ac vaccine efforts. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bill. I think you, you said a lot. I think a um, couple of things I just wanted to mention that um, from my own experience, sometimes the status of federally qualified health center will focus on the federal. <laughs> Um, right. You're all, each one of our speakers represents a private nonprofit organization um, right. that is, has a particular status as a federally qualified health center in FPC, but in character is a private nonprofit organization that exists for the public benefit. So I think that, um, I think among the many things both you and Dr. Butler have said is that you're private in character, you have some federal funding, but you're, you know, public benefit and purpose, and like direct relief, we're, you know, we're entirely privately funded, but we exist for the public benefit. So I think it, there's a lot of assets that we have to bring as a country to bear, and particularly in the areas, as you've mentioned, where there's uh, concerns or stigmas or uh, medically underserved areas with people without other access points. It's, you know, it, it's essential, I think, to recognize that and, and build on the structures that exist without trying to create a new one at higher cost and perhaps right. effectiveness. So thank you. And I think we'll get back in to both, both you and Dr. Butler made uh, references to um, what might be called kind of, um, the, the virus doesn't discriminate, right? But the effects are, are inconsistent. So I think, you know, you all have views, I'm sure about uh, what that reflects and what can be done about it. But before we get to that, let me introduce um, another medical director, uh, Dr. Shapiro, uh, the medical director from Altamed. And I wish very much I had put all of their bios and impressive backgrounds online. Uh, you would be even be more impressed than you will be just hearing it uh, from them. But Dr. Shapiro, welcome and thank you. Tell us about what's going on at Altamed and what you think and what we should all know. 
Thomas, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, nobody has been saved from the craziness of COVID times. Uh, it, it has been almost one year to the date that uh, we started having and planning all these things. And we heard that there's a virus and it sounded very, very, very in tune with what we heard from SARS and uh, with H1N1 pandemic. And it was quite interesting that uh, our community started to feel that. And slowly, you know, um, we, we started to see a lot of problems inside of our communities. Altamet has been uh, in the, the Orange County and LA County for more than 50 years. We serve um, probably more than 300,000 lives uh, in these areas. And uh, of course, we are part of the community. And I saw one of the, the, the questions over there that if um, our staff, uh, it looks like the patients that we treat and the answer is yes. Even though that I have a funny accent, I come from a little uh, small city called Mexico City then um, we, we all try to be as parallel as, as our community because this helps. And we have seen that from Altamed and it's not just the medical aspect of it, but as Dr. Butler said, uh, and, and, and Dr. Boland said, it, it's the cultural aspect of it. It's the mental health aspect of it. And there's the social dynamics that we're seeing around our communities. And um, we have stand in, with our communities, for our communities for a couple of years. Right now, as all, we always know that telehealth was coming, you know, the structural payments for it were not there. Anything that we did with telehealth before as federal qualified health centers was because we th thought that it was the right thing to do. And um, we did it, but we had a beautiful plan for two years that we needed to implement in two weeks. Then uh, absolutely all the efforts that we had on technology uh, were there. We had all the, you know, the basic stuff, but we had the same question, you know, like, is our, uh, our, our patients are going to respond? Are we going to have technological problems? Is the internet divide so big that we, we're, we're not going to actually help our community the way that we were helping them before? And yes, we knew that we had COVID-19 there. And yes, we knew that, you know, it was hurting us, but by the way, diabetes was not stopping high blood pressures was still there, you know, screenings for, for uh, cervical cancer and so forth. And of course, you know, I'm also a pediatrician. I saw the pain of, of, of the mom saying, well, doc, you have been preaching to me that vaccines are the best thing. And right now I, can, I do not have access to you. What do we do? Then we started creating, you know, uh, areas where, you know, drive-through vaccination centers. We started trying to do a lot of things, understanding what the community needed and services that were way above and beyond the, the regular federal qualified health centers because that's what the community needed. We're flexible, all of us in federal qualified health centers. We are here to serve the community. And sometimes, you know, the rules change. And uh, one of the things that COVID has taught us right now, especially from Orange County to Elling County, is that life is changing all the time. There's no, you know, basic thing. It's, you know, you pick up the pace and you start serving. And one of the beautiful things that we did is we changed, you know, and, and, and we, we, we're very flexible from not just seeing patients, but being with the patients. Um, we have an amazing uh, community specialist group that we, it's our promotoras groups. that are still talking with patients, diabetes group business and making sure that, yes, we have, we are a pandemic mode right now, but we cannot afford to lose a grip of prevention services. And sometimes it's very hard because, you know, our community is hearing a double, double message. Stay home, but take care of yourself. Eat better, but don't go to the supermarket. Then you have all this messaging that it's very confusing to all of us. And, 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 and you know, any medical director, anybody on, 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 on leadership will tell you that we are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat automatically our communities, when we tell them stay home, you know, it's about survival. It's, it's not about, you know, yeah, it's, it's nice. I can tell the community, no, 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 it's survival. They need to do one or two jobs, go out there, come back. And of course there's less time to actually go to the doctor, take care of their diabetes, get the medication, um, get transportation. They're using public transportation. They're more exposed and they're in the first line. All of this combined, it's a perfect storm. And we have, we have been talking about this, it's decades 
and, and everybody's actually kind of um, surprised, like, oh my God, like underserved communities are suffering more than other. Yes, it's decades of problems with something that we call social determinants of health. It's where you actually, um, in your, you have poor school districts. You have pro problems actually to accessing nutrition sources of food. Then um, you have, you know, toxic stress around you. You have a lot of things that are very hard to conquer. And of course, those things lead to depression, anxiety, something that we hate that is diabetes, obesity, and all these problems. And you just add a little bit of fire to this perfect bowl of explosives and you, you know, add a pandemic. Of course, the patients that are diabetic and obese, uh, obese are ending up in the ICU, hospitals, and of course, sadly, dying. And that's one of the things that we, we need to be doing. And most of all the efforts that we have, and just to you know, just to start the questions and everything else with the panel, is that we need right now to make sure that we're vaccinating our communities against fear with a dose of truth. Us as doctors, us as healthcare providers, we are the trusted source of information for our community. Then if we can bundle all together, we start like messaging the way that we need to, to do it, the, com the, com the, community, the community will start reaching up. The, the economic part of it will reach up and we'll have less fatalities and, and complications on the long term of COVID-19. They're not just medical, but you know, it's all of us. Then a pleasure to be with you, Thomas. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you clarified that quote because I've heard you say it before and I, I had garbled it was like vaccinate um, against stupidity with something and it was very well said. I think vaccinate communities against fear with truth. And uh, no, I think you've all talked about it, if we can, um, about a couple of things that just, uh, I suppose you weren't, any of you weren't surprised that your communities were particularly hard hit. It's shocking. It seems like uh, we reverted to the recognition uh, that certain there's disparities uh, in inequities and in access to health and health outcomes. Um, so it's very consistent with what we already knew, but in the good news is it's causing a re a reexamination and focus. One of the questions I want to ask you, and you've all touched upon it, we don't have a heat a secret health system that we can pull out when we have a crisis. You've got to squeeze what you can and reallocate what you've got. And you've all done that. Um, so you've all had to make rapid adjustments to telehealth. You've had to kind of maintain that, uh, which you've each spoken about as clinicians, the in great intangible of trust uh, as, a uh, as a trusted source of medical information. And it's not like everything else went away. You've had to go two tracks. You've had to go straight on at COVID and also recognize that the indirect uh, effects of COVID, uh, we're leaving other things unattended and getting worse. So um, talk about how you've been able to kind of develop both tracks, uh, maintain that central focus on the dimension of trust that you've all talked about and, and how you and your staffs are doing it and what others can do from the private philanthropic community uh, to help you out. I mean, I think, as you know, I think we try to We've received COVID funding. We provided it uh, for many times the indirect effects of COVID, recognizing that if you go down, if your facilities close or you get financially wobbly, the only place left for your patients to go is where? The hospital. <laughs> At a time when we're trying to reserve hospital space for those who get really sick uh, from COVID or really hurt from something else. So would you mind, Dr. Butler, just talking about how you've uh, juggled all that and you still seem to be sort of smiling and hopeful, I guess, <laughs> going forward. And no problem. Um, no, I'm always hopeful. I'm a glass, a glass half full kind of guy, to be honest. Uh, I think you need to be in this kind of work. Um, it's mission driven. And I think the challenge is the passion that you can do something. Um, and I, you know, and again, as in, to agree with my colleagues, um, you know, with with COVID, um, you know, these social these, these disparities we've seen with terms of COVID deaths, COVID infections, as is as, as as um, Dr. Shapiro mentioned, again, this is uh, not something I think any of us were surprised with. We know that those same disparities exist for pretty much all the chronic diseases in our country, in terms of diabetes, hypertension, uh, the HIV and AIDS, et cetera. You know, poor people, people of color suffer disproportionately from all of those things, mainly due to those social determinants of health, which 
and, and unfortunately interfere with the ability for those folks to access care and receive the best care they can. Um, COVID, unfortunately, in itself led to a disparity in terms of COVID rates, but then interfered with our ability to care for all the other chronic diseases that we're dealing with. So unfortunately, having a population of you know, diabetics that are, you know, in a sense, uh, already difficult to manage when we're really open at full capacity, you throw in COVID with now you know, restrictions and access to care, as Dr. Shapiro mentioned in pediatrics, we tend, our populations tend to have lower vaccination rates and having to actually manage those issues. So we had to get creative and we had to, again, be flexible and find ways to do it. He's talked, you know, he has, a, they, their clinic did drive up vaccine clinics. We had, a, we, we, we got nutrition classes to get on Zoom and, um, or we had our, many of our providers again doing phone visits. We were able to access and this is something that this was from a donation uh, for remote monitoring devices. So, like blood pressure cuffs that we could, you know, give to patients to take home, and then they can report their blood pressure. Glucometers that can check their sugar. Some that actually are are linked. Actually, if they have internet access, some could link through Bluetooth that you could actually see their sugars and blood pressure. But being able to kind of continue to manage those folks, and then again being creative with our facilities, with our access, setting up again a safe area for, to come get a vaccine, to come get your flu shot without having to say enter the clinic, et cetera. Um, you know, I think some clinic would, depending on their resources, I'm, a, I'm probably a smaller group. I'm not as big as say Dr. Shapiro's clinic, but um, we were able to again, adjust some of the, the roles that our, our, our staff is playing to kind of meet those needs. And again, the support that is is that can help in terms of, because there's technology that can be used um, sometimes it doesn't always have to be someone with, you know, 400, you know, gigabyte internet at their house to actually connect with them. You can actually do some things just with a basic cell phone. It's just, again, how do you adapt to the, the needs of the patient you have? And we know our patients. We know what can work and what can't. Um, and I think it's, you know, being able to, you know, use us as resources to do that has, has been critical through COVID. And even with our diabetics, we did get some folks whose A1Cs, their control out of control, you know, did go up. A lot of people are sitting at home, nothing to do, you know, eating, et cetera, not being able to see the doctor. But I think it could have been much worse without some of the changes we made. Dr. Butler, yeah, are there, yeah, I've, I've heard in other venues you talk about some of the particular um, concerns or suspicions about vaccines among uh, Black residents of the United States. Um, and in particular, but I, I think, can you talk about that? Because I think it, it's so kind of euphemistically referred to now as, you know, vaccine hesitancy, but it, from um, my, you know, it takes a lot of different shapes. I think some people are anti-vax for, for other reasons. Um, I think there's a lot of social media activity. There's historic reasons for others or, um, but it, you've talked about it so well. I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing it with the uh, listeners today. And, I, and I'll, I'll speak, um, um, again, as an African-American provider, working with a large uh, population of African-American patients, as many of you know, historically, there has been this issue of, of mistrust of the medical system by the African-American community, as we know, is, you know, is issues like the Tuskegee experiments that were done back in the 1930s and 40s, where African-American men in the South were not treated for syphilis to study them. That's still as a scar in the psyche, I think, of African-Americans, and really a system that traditionally they received, um, because of, you could say, systemic racism, in some ways, second class healthcare for a long time. So the doctors weren't trusted. And one of the things I've seen just in my career is coming into the health centers in underserved communities of color is being able to um, show them that the system, when delivered in a way with compassion, like centers like ourselves, understanding them culturally, having that competency, as Dr. Bolin talked about, that that we can be trusted because we have their best interest at heart. You know, I mean, patients know we're not out here trying to make money off of this community, right? We know that we're here for health and wellness. Um, and the idea for me, I always, my, my philosophies is, you know, our, unfortunately our health system is designed for sickness and not for wellness. You know, as you know, more than 90% of the dollars in healthcare is spent on like the, the last, you know, year of someone's life in our country versus investing in how do we put systems in place that bring equity and wellness to folks? And again, COVID just, I think, pulled the sheet off of all that again, really in a really rapid 
um, I'd say just blatantly obvious way when you saw these disparities. And you can see all those, those little factors of social determinants like Dr. Shapiro mentioned, really just playing out right before our eyes. So again, I think it gives us all a great opportunity now um, you know, for those who wanna support efforts in health to see how can each of you in, in these areas see where can you make a difference? And I think again, hearing our voices, I, and again, appreciating those who are in this webinar is important. This is a beginning, but hearing our voices and helping us guide where some of those resources can be directed to help us deliver care to populations that, you know, we kind of understand their needs. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I think for those of you who aren't steeped in the, the lexicon of experts like these, I think the social determinants of health rolls off their tongues. But I think, um, I think there's a layman's explanation for it. And I'm going to put Dr. Bowen in the spot to talk about it, because I think as you're talking, it, it's not, I think your careers and your organizations and your lives and your staffs it's not concerned because for a person because they're hosting a virus that we're all scared of. That's not the motivation for the concern. It's a longstanding presence and concern about them as people and providing access. And I think just listening to you, that's got to be an element that is a foundational piece of the trust that you're commenting on and you clearly want to maintain and prize and use to combat the virus. But Dr. Bowen, is there a layman's way to, um, for those of us who, don't have advanced degrees in public health, um, social determinants, what does that mean? And right, so social determinants of healthcare uh, you know, means that there are things that would impact individuals' uh, experiences with health and, and illness that have nothing to do with the personal choices that they make, but have to do with where they live, whether they're living in poverty, whether they happen to live in a neighborhood, for example, where a coal plant happens to be uh, right down the street and blowing coal dust into their uh, into their noses. Uh, fortunately, the uh, coal mines are being uh, shut down, but you know the point is still there that there are places where people live because it's only the uh, the only economic places where they can live that happen to have other um, uh, conditions in those neighborhoods that are disadvantageous for general health. That's probably the most obvious. Uh, uh, e example. Um, poverty itself is a social determinant of health care because uh, if you don't have enough money to buy good quality food, you buy the food that you can buy. Well, the food that you can buy that is cheaper has a lot of sodium and a lot of cholesterol in it. And so is it surprising that folks that have uh, that source for their nutrition have higher rates of blood pressure and diabetes and stroke? Shouldn't be if you think about it a little bit. But those are those are some of the social determinants of healthcare. Um, you know, I think that the the, the ways that our organization, uh, you know, kind of pivoted and used our, uh, uh, you know, some of our pre-existing strengths. Um, one of the things about being a, a, a federally qualified healthcare center is that the concept of funding uh, FQHCs is that you're given funding to provide health care that can begin to uh, recognize that, that individuals need a lot more uh, attention from different disciplines uh, to achieve good quality uh, out, uh, health care outcomes. So, for example, we have a clinical pharmacy program uh, in, in our FQHC. It's wonderful. Uh, and one particular example of that is in, in diabetes control. So, uh, first of all, it's, it's really advantageous to have other disciplines be able to help the physicians um, monitor and uh, modify treatment for their diabetic patients, and clinical pharmacists are, are really ideally suited to that purpose. Uh, and guess what? They don't have to see the person face-to-face. -face. They can do this by telehealth. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that in the midst of this pandemic, we were able to launch our clinical pharmacy program that is able to enabled us to improve the uh, uh, hemoglobin A1Cs in our diabetic patients. That was fabulous. Um, you know, uh, uh, Derek mentioned about uh, uh, blood pressure cuffs. You know, the, the first thing that occurred to me uh, as it was months and months were going down the road uh, since I'd seen some of my patients were I could look at their 
uh, HIV viral loads and see that they're wonderfully controlled, but I don't know what their blood pressure is. Mm -hmm. So I would say, well, you know, listen, John, why don't you walk into your local CVS pharmacy, go in the back and sit down next to the, uh, <laughs> sit down next to the, uh, the pharmacy and, and take, your, uh, take your blood pressure and call me and let me know what it is. Well, you know, that's great, but, you know, people got to go out and, you know, mingle with uh, lots of folks that have got virus and didn't want to do that. Uh, so uh, we began to explore uh, the, the ability to get blood pressure cuffs delivered, blood pressure monitoring devices delivered to our patients. We were successful uh, to some degree, but, you know, all of that stuff costs money. It's got to come from someplace. So we were looking to the health care plans, you know, to the managed health care plans. And uh, we got some pushback. You know, they wanted to, uh, you know, tighten the criteria. They wanted to make sure that people had, you know, really severe hypertension uh, that had end organ uh, uh, failure. Uh, before they would let loose with a blood pressure cuff. And I thought, that's kind of stupid, you know? I mean, if you got in there with a blood pressure cuff when somebody was beginning to uh, need to modify their treatment to get it under better control, that's the time to really engage them with this, uh, you know, home blood pressure monitoring. So we have found during the course of this pandemic, yes, there are plenty of times where you should be seeing patients face-to-face -face when you can't. But there's a lot of things that we can do remotely that help engage our patients. And if you give them the tools, if you make uh, available the uh, uh, tools to, to help engage them in healthcare, you can improve uh, health outcomes. So I'm hoping that as we you know, come out of this pandemic, hopefully, God willing, uh, we will retain some of the skills and knowledge that we've gained uh, during our pivoting that will help us continue to take really excellent care of our patients. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. I think um, if I can turn a little bit to the, the issue of vaccination, because I think you've all mentioned it, um, it's one of the other things that you're gonna have to, uh, we're trying to figure out how to do along with adapting the, uh, the current health system to take care of the stuff we already knew was bad. Yeah. Well, now it, it, there's been a compounding factor brought about by COVID and and thank you for sharing how you've been trying to manage that by doing things differently so you could liberate time to deal with the direct uh, you know, impacts of, of COVID and the threats. But the looming issue is vaccination. And I think you are all in areas uh, of either geographic areas that have been identified legally as medically underserved or dealing with populations that have been determined by the federal government to be populations that are medically underserved. Right. And as we said, these are people who are getting infected more, getting hospitalized more, getting tested less and dying at higher rates. So when we look forward at vaccination, how to do that, uh, it's gonna cost a lot. Um, it, what do you think, I mean, it, it's to a layman, it seems that the investment will have more residue if it goes to places that you know do vaccinations all the time, <laughs> and but what do you think? Is it a reasonable role for for you and your colleagues to play in the vaccination efforts, which so far have been uh, largely government managed? Um, I saw that the federal government's announced uh, that it's coming to California to to do its uh, direct federal run vaccination sites because of the severity of the the case. But what's your take on how we can leverage what exists in area communities and uh, places of high need um, that do vaccinations already for COVID vaccinations. That was a long-winded question, Dr. Shapiro. Did you understand it? And if so, could you answer it and uh, make it? Yes, in summary, okay. why if we have been investing in something called federal qualified health centers that understand the community, they have the staff, they have the resources and they understand how to communicate in a, in a, in a cultural sensitive way why are we not um, utilizing those resources? I, I think that this is a moment to say we are here and we are ready to help. Uh, I, I can all go back and we probably can have a lot of academic discussions on um, why yes or why not. But right now, the reality, we are still on the ground and we're still and we're going to be here for many more years. Um, and it's important because I, I give you an example right now, Thomas, that a lot of our senior citizens that we know that they're Hispano, then they put them in a higher uh, risk factor. They are more than 65 higher, higher factor. Then do you think that they are getting the vaccines right now? 
they want to, they have heard, they understand that, you know, you know, the majority of them actually, they want to, but in order to, for them to be activated and actually end up getting the vaccine, there are so many steps, so many steps that it's almost impossible. My dream is to actually have in our clinics the possibility to do that. And we can actually set up mass stuff. All of us, you know, on, on, the, on this call, we can actually create that part. We can actually inform our communities of those that are on the line that they go like, oh, I, I want to wait until I have more data, but we already know that it's safe and effective vaccines. And we not only have one vaccine, we have many more. We have, you know, that's why it's important to give the last name and the first name of the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine from Moderna and the COVID-19 vaccine from, from uh, Pfizer. We have them there. Then we are here. We know where, where, we, where our community lives. We are part of that community. Let us help and, and push the message one, because that's something that we already can do. And most importantly, what's the objective? to close the gap for vaccinations. Mm -hmm. If you see right now the rates of African-Americans and Hispanics and Asians getting vaccines compared to other groups, we are in the minority. And it's kind of, you know, the, 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 the slides that you had at the beginning, we are on the other way around. We're supposed to be getting more vaccines to actually stop this and actually, you know, recoup all the, the, the bad things that have been happening with underserved communities. And it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And it's not happening because there's, you know, the infrastructure is, it's, it's, it's new, we have never done this. I recognize completely that, but right now that we know that we need to act, people are dying. And the, the more, the longer we have this, the, the pandemic, more viruses will come and you know, the mutations will continue to spread. Then, you know, as Dr. Fauci actually, I'm, I'm going to quote him, if we don't stop this, you know, it will continue to grow. And that's what viruses do. Then we need right now, especially the, the communities that we're more exposed, we're suffering the most, and we have less of that resiliency in our community, we get, need to get vaccinated. And, and in reality, we are here completely to help. We're not going anywhere. We have the, the, the people, we have the teams, and most importantly, we have the secret sauce. We're part of the community. That's pretty good. You should uh, you can run for office someday, Dr. Screw. Just, just file it away. <laughs> You know, I think, you know, directly for so much with uh, the the corporate sector and, you know, the private sector, I know from our conversations, they recognize two things, that they have an established backbone that works for many of the same reasons that you did. And they're perfectly willing to provide that. And they also recognize um, where they don't. And they've been supportive in recognizing that. So for me, I think what you're talking about is what we've seen trying to leverage what exists in the in the commercial sector, use what we've got. We've got the richest country in the history of the world. Use the pieces that already exist. And I, I don't think it's, um, I think that's clearly recognized by, um, you know, corporate entities. I mean, you know, the difference I think between a corporation and direct relief is at, at some level, if you're in business, you have to go looking for people who ultimately are gonna buy what your goods and services or else you won't be in business for long. And we go looking for people who are never, are just not in the position, right? And I think many of those people find themselves relying on um, you and your colleagues to provide those services. But whether it's for business or, or uh, not for profit, you want to do it as well and efficiently as it can be done using what exists. And I think we've learned so much of the, the efficiency, the tools, they are developed in the corporate sector because they have to be. And so I think on the other side of this, how do you, I mean, my great hope is that the private philanthropic efforts, as well as the government um, spending, you know, leaves community health centers in a stronger place at the other side of this than much more weakened because they've spent the money in places that are going to pop up one time. But um, I did want to leave a few minutes for, for questions. I think there, there, uh, there's hundreds of people who've joined the call. Um, I think uh, I was going to try to uh, funnel some questions around if there are any. Um, oh, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, but talk about some of the private, how, how some of the flexibility that comes along with private funding as private nonprofit corporations that have the status as a federally qualified health center. You're not a federal agency, right? You're a private nonprofit. What are some of the private funding that, uh, that comes forward allow you to do? I think, you know, one of you um, talked about some of the remote monitoring devices, the challenge of actually financing something like a blood pressure cuff, but uh, talk if you would about when it's available, what it does and allows you to do um, 
if you wouldn't mind. Dr. Shapiro, do you want to start and we can move it around? Gladly. Uh, uh, first of all, right now we need a lot of help with senior care. Uh, our seniors are at home, alone. Um, you know, they mostly are monolingual. Uh, technology is not one of their fortes. Uh, we need to, to help them on that part. And a lot of the programs that we could create is for that. The other one is actually to make sure that we have enough promotoras, community health workers, to go out there virtually and in physic because we actually have um, community fairs that is drive through community fairs that they are actually sharing the information and train the trainers. That's the other one that is very important. We need to activate our, our youth to actually spread the information and make sure that, you know, first of all, capture any, any gossip and bad thing that is going out there, get it in front of us, make sure that we clean it and share the real information that we have that it's evidence-based. And the most important thing is, you know, the support of the teams and the communities. Um, right now, the, uh, I had, you know, I shared this with, with a group. Uh, I had a pleasure to be on a phone bank and, and, the, and it was a COVID-19 phone bank. And most of the communities were asking for food. They were asking for rental, uh, rent, you know, how to pay the, the rent. And at the end of the day, uh, it was like, how can I get healthcare? Hmm. And of course, yes, there's a pandemic. That was the fourth question. Then we have layers of things that we need to solve in order to get there. Then we need to start packaging anything that we do for COVID-19, uh, you know, the vaccine uh, medications or anything related to that part of the community that we were talking about social uh, social determinants of health to actually bridge that. And those are my 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 uh, Christmas list uh, for anybody. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the technology is very important. And of course, bridging that gap, it, it's something that we need to do. Thank you. And can I just put in I just two seconds too? Um, everything he said, number one, plus I think the other side, and that's, and he's talking about vaccine kind of delivery, getting it to those folks. But remember, we have that piece of vaccine hesitancy or reluctance. We need help with marketing. We need help with educating people. Those of you in the corporate world, you all have, you guys market your products, you know, get your spokespeople out there, you know, saying that your company supports vaccination, get the, get the movie stars and the athletes to publicly, you know, announce this. I mean, I'm sure Dr. Fauci got vaccinated on TV, but sometimes people want to see, you know, LeBron James get vaccinated. I'm not going to call him out like that, but I will. But, <laughs> see, but something that I think helps certain communities be that culturally can make a difference in changing people's thought process, knowing that this is becoming something normalized and people understanding this is one of our pathways out of COVID. Everybody's sick of COVID restrictions, the, the effect on the economy, understanding this is a pillar for us to get out of this and maybe helping with that marketing campaign and then, and then again supporting, as Dr. Shapiro mentioned, our delivery systems to get it to folks too, right? Find a way to get it to those seniors who are sitting at home. You know, I mean, give Uber uh, gift cards or something to get a vaccine there, et cetera. Lots of ideas are there. So, but, but I think that other piece for education is going to be critical too. And I'll leave it for Dr. Bolin to finish up. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we've been a, a, you know, a large nonprofit organization for many, many, many years. And we've uh, uh, received funding from lots of sources, uh, government and, and nonprofit uh, uh, and, and other donors. Um, I think that a, a great way for the callers uh, to uh, respond to this would be uh, to um, put out uh, willingness to uh, receive proposals from organizations like ours for just all of the projects that have been mentioned by, uh, you know, by my colleagues, uh, you know, education, outreach, marketing. We're the ones who know how to do it. Uh, Give us the access to some funding. We'll come up with a proposal. We'll come up with proposals, and we can send them to you, and then you can vet them, and you can decide you know, who you want to fund with how much money and what kind of deliverables you want, and we'll do it. We'll do the deliverables. We'll do the messaging. We'll find out all the information that will help move this entire train down the road toward everybody getting vaccinated. Thank you. It's all right. I mean, I like people busting down my clinic doors to get the vaccine versus me trying to sell them and convince them to get it. Help us right. do that. Well, look, I was a big fan when we started the call and before, so I'm, you know, I'm admitting uh, my bias, my bias to, uh, and gratitude for what you're doing, um, sharing those thoughts. And 
you know, for those on the call, I think when direct, direct release funding is uh, with intentionality provided with uh, maximum discretion and flexibility to allow you to do what makes sense in your respective communities, it is very difficult to find one model that works everywhere uh, the same way. And that's why each health center is rooted in its community. And that is of enormous value. So to the extent we can provide uh, a pooling mechanism to drive funding um, to allow you to do that in recognition of these historic times, we will continue to do that. Uh, we've done far more than we had anticipated doing 12 months ago. Um, but it's, I think it's great that those hundreds of you who've been able to join the call to just hear from, from you, uh, probably unusual to hear from clinicians, uh, physicians, talk mainly about things non-clinical. That's consistent with, uh, I think, your organization's missions, uh, the missions of health centers, um, but unusual nonetheless. So I can't thank you enough for everyone who's uh, taken time to join us today to, to listen to these terrific experts uh, who are involved with direct relief and part of it in, in any way. Thank you so much to each of you and particularly to our wonderful panelists today. Keep going. Keep hope alive and, uh, and keep us informed and we'll stretch as much as we possibly can to keep helping y'all out. Thanks everybody.